We got Brandon Scoop B. Robinson waiting patiently for us as we uh, bring him in. Uh, Scoop, first of all, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for checking on the Causeway Street podcast. How you doing? Man, I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm just home cooking a little little something to eat. Uh, you ready to watch the World Series. Okay. There we go. Right, what you got there? You got something good? Just a little something. something. Um, just some okra and tomatoes with some rice and some baked beans and putting a little steamed shrimp with it. Hachi machi. Yeah, there we go. All, all right. Man, Brandon, Brandon's got some company coming over. Yep. All right, we won't keep you on the phone for too long. Next time we'll bring no, him man, in the studio, man. Like, you got to bring some leftovers. And this is for me, myself, and I. I just was on a, on a road trip. <laughs> uh, I see. All right. Well, hey, Brandon, we appreciate you taking the time. So Brandon was, like we said from the top of, of the episode, uh, one of the first guys that, that broke this story about uh, Kevin Durant and what he's going to do next season. Brandon, um, I'm just going to let you have the floor here. What are you hearing exactly about Kevin Durant, where his head is at in terms of 2019? Well, the Los Angeles Lakers is the team, the destination, and the uh, final, I don't want to say final attraction, but the coming attraction, if you will. It's La La Land, L.A., Hollywood. And I uh, got a tip from a, a source of mine uh, in September. It kind of broke the Internet, and uh, I found a lot of true <laughs> people and some of the thoughts that they had, but I'm sticking with my source, and, and that's what I was told. The biggest thing is uh, teaming with LeBron uh, and uh, winning some championships for the foreseeable future. I'm not just saying this because I'm on the phone with you guys and you're in the Boston area, but um, in the next year or two, you're going to see a, a rehash of uh, the Celtics and Lakers rivalry, and why not have the best chess piece next to LeBron James uh, in Los Angeles? Uh, and, and the Celtics aren't done fine-tuning. So you're going to see another Celtics-Lakers rivalry, and it starts this summer. Yeah, you can sort of see that when LeBron went there, that was sort of destined to be. But Durant joining him, huh? I mean, uh, how much you believe this source? You believe you you riding and dying with this source? Um, I ain't riding with anybody but Jesus Christ Himself. But this is what I'll tell you: um, the source that uh, reached out to me uh, gave me some tips on a few other things uh, that became true. Uh, told me a week before uh, Luol Deng and the Lakers got the buyout that that was going to happen. Uh, that same source uh, told me that Kevin Durant was going to be doing a TV show with ESPN Plus as in production with LeBron James being the special guest. Um, that was news uh, a week after he, this particular source told me. And this source has also been uh, in the conversation or had conversations with the powers that be pertaining to uh, the Houston Rockets and the Minnesota Timberwolves, which I've reported on uh, over the past month has changed. So this source has knowledge, has been right on about some things, and certain things are still developing. So okay. I won't say I'm right or dying with the source, but the source is in the know. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, Brandon, how much of this plays into what LeBron James did? Like, is this – was this whole thing calculated? Because I can't help but think that there's no way LeBron James would go to L.A. without something like this promise. Do you think this is something that it was calculated a year ago, maybe two years ago, between him and Durant, something that they talked about before LeBron ultimately decided to leave Cleveland and head over to L.A.? Did he go to L.A. knowing that Kevin Durant down the road was going to be waiting for him after this season? Well, this is what I'll say to you. I'll say to you that uh, LeBron James going to the Los Angeles Lakers uh, this soft season uh, was definitely a, a balance of basketball and uh, intellectual property and branding. Uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers had their window with LeBron, and LeBron went to the Western Conference to let the young boys, the Celtics and the, and the 76ers, as well as the Wizards, figure things out. Um, that being said, uh, Los Angeles was a perfect move. You have a young talent on that team. You have a Brandon Ingram who, despite – you know, having hands, having some good hands, uh, <laughs> has some hands on the basketball court as well. You have Kyle Kuzma who can play well. Uh, Lonzo Ball can, can play a, a role with that team as well, as well as Rajon Rondo. But um, I will say to you um, that LeBron and everything that he does is calculated. If you listen to what he said during the NBA Finals this past uh, last year's NBA Finals, the last season's NBA Finals, um, he said that the, the place where he goes uh, will be about family and, and, and somewhere that the family is familiar with. Uh, he, he doesn't speak in cold. He's not a rapper, but Los Angeles is a place where um, he has cold home in addition to Northeast Ohio. Um, and, and for Kevin Durant to come in, you figure, free agency next season, what will they do with Draymond? What will they do with Clay Thompson? Uh, you know, Boogie Cousins has some things to figure out. The Warriors are still the NBA champs. Boogie Cousins told me last month that you know, the Golden State Warriors are like play, though. You can mold them to whatever you want them to be. You'll see what happens this offseason with the Warriors. Huh? Will they make it to the championship? We'll see. But I think when you look at the Lakers, they're definitely not done building. Um, and I think signing LeBron was the first step. I will tell you, 
uh, that LeBron was so deep into uh, signing with the Lakers this offseason. And Paul George, and he did talk. Uh, I will tell you that Paul George did agree verbally uh, to sign with the Lakers. And then in the 25th hour, decided mm. to go to OKC. LeBron was so deep into it, he couldn't back out of it. Um, so, you know, LeBron is definitely uh-huh. in L.A. for the next two to three years, four-year contract. But, you know, I don't think that they're done building. Kawhi Leonard in Toronto has, you know, changed some things too. But they definitely need one or two more pieces, as you're seeing in the first half of the season or the first few games of the season. Yeah, so so that was my question. KD, so let's hypothetically say KD is the front runner to go to L.A. and join up with LeBron. Do they still make a play for Kawhi Leonard then? Because all signs point to Kawhi Leonard – making a pit stop in Toronto and ending up in LA. How does this news and this um affect Kawhi Leonard and and uh his future? I can't speak definitively about whether or not Kawhi Leonard uh will join the Los Angeles Lakers because I think the NBA is a long season. Um and Toronto and he are pretty cozy earlier in this early in the season. Um and you saw what happened with Paul George this off season where he ended up staying uh, with OKC. What I can tell you is, I think LeBron and KD are both in perfect situations because um, LeBron leaves the Eastern Conference that was becoming incredibly, increasingly more competitive. The Western Conference is too. Uh, but he doesn't have to go against the Warriors in the NBA Finals. So when you look at what LeBron is doing, he's setting up shots for the future. Um, when you look at all those other pieces, a lot of other teams are kind of like the big three. When you looked at the big three in his first year, there were retired players who were looking at that situation, seeing how they did it in their first year. Second year, you have more players. Next year, you'll have more players coming in. To that point, when you look at the Lakers, it's the same scenario. You have a situation where people are watching LeBron and seeing what he and all those younger guys are doing, the mix of younger guys and older guys. I think people have the misconceptions that it's just a young team. That being said, there will be some people that will find Los Angeles competitive. You know, So I, I think... When you look at the long haul, LeBron is in a good situation because there's no pressure to get to the finals. Everybody's expecting that the Warriors will go to the finals. I mean, there's, there was talk before the season started that the Rockets are, are, are still a viable option. Defensively, there are some things that have changed, but the Lakers are in a good position to recruit because you know what you're getting in the purple and gold. How much does legacy play a part in this? Because we all know that, I mean, if we're talking just from a basketball standpoint in terms of free agents making decisions and and, and changing teams, there's no other two athletes, I should say, actually in professional sports that receive more criticism than LeBron James and, and Kevin Durant. What, in your humble opinion, what is it going to say about these two guys if they were to join forces and compete for a title together? What, what does it say about their legacy? You know, I'm, I'm still in the camp of a, a believer that LeBron James does care about getting the ultimate title of being called the greatest basketball player of all time. And I think in his mind, if he wins two or three more titles and comes anywhere closer to Michael Jordan than he already is, I mean, he's halfway there. I think that's going to, in his mind, solidify himself. What does that mean for, for a guy like Kevin Durant? Because obviously Kevin Durant is going to be a, a career that's going to you know, continue after LeBron James is done. Do you see Kevin Durant, someone that's, that's going to set up shop in L.A. and sort of bridge the gap between now and the next generation? How do you see things playing out? Well, let me, let me ask you first question about the legacy. I think that fans' perception of legacy and players' perception of legacy are two different things. I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. When I was in grad school at Hofstra University, I did an imp- independent study on uh, guys like Jeremy Tyler and guys like Brandon Jennings who worked the system uh, and you know, found ways to get into the NBA without doing the one and done. And if you sneaker, uh, sneaker great uh, or sneaker deal maker, king maker, Sonny DeCaro. And he said to me, you know, Brandon, Players like Charles Barkley, players like Patrick Ewing, players like John Stockton, and, and almost Kevin Garnett, and, as well as Carmelo, Malone, all were loyal to one team and didn't, went, didn't have anything to show for it. He said to me, and this was in 2010, he said, the next generation of players that come are going to be as loyal. So he said, you look at the John Walls, you look at the, 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 the Brandon Jennings, you look at the you know all these guys that were coming in next, the Derrick Roses, et cetera. They are looking at brand and they're looking at championships, and the money is not and is not as much of a part of it as people think. To that point, when you look at Kevin Durant, he made a power move based upon what he saw. He went to the Warriors because it, it, it allowed him to preserve his legs, preserve his career, and to get other opportunities in Northern California. When you look at LeBron, when he left Cleveland the first time, he went to Miami. There's no sales tax. 
You know, he was able to build with his friends and to win championships. All that wear and tear on your body for what? To kind of paraphrase Chris Brown, these teams ain't loyal. <laughs> you know, when you look at a situation where LeBron's decided what he's doing for what's best for his family, he's in control of his destiny. The World Series is going on right now. You guys are Red Sox guys, I'm sure. Kurt Flood, he was a guy who was able to dictate his free agency based upon making decisions for him. I think people criticize Kevin Durant and LeBron James for making moves that are best for them. I also think that LeBron James gave up that whole chase of Jordan's legacy a long time ago. Because, number one, LeBron is not Michael Jordan. Number two, LeBron plays more like Oscar Robertson and Magic Johnson than he ever did Michael Jordan. And three, I know for me, Dr. J gave the baton to Michael Jordan as this innovative player, right? My opinion, Michael Jordan gave the baton to Tim Duncan, but he's a big man. There was this gap. Was it Kobe? Was it Iverson? Was it this person? LeBron James is this generation's Michael Jordan because he did it his way in a way Michael could have never done it. Number one, no, he didn't win six championships, but he's been socially conscious. He's built schools. But also, Michael made it possible for someone like LeBron or Kobe or even Allen Iverson or Derrick Rose to have the sneaker contracts that they did. I think oftentimes when we make comparisons, because that's what makes people comfortable, they're not clear-cut comparisons. LeBron is LeBron. Michael is Michael. Magic is Magic. And Dr. J is Dr. J. So I don't think that those players look at legacies as much as they think. Like Hmm. I don't think they go to bed at night and say, hey, dang, if I go here, what are the fans going to think? Because the fans don't pay the bills. That's so I, I think it's a little but different. They, I don't think that they're consulting with fans when making their decisions. They're right. making decisions for what's best for them and their families. So, yeah, I, I, I guess I get it. I mean, it's two sides to that fence, right? I mean, you look at, like you said, the Ewings, the Stocktons, the Malones, absolutely Barkley. beloved figures in that city because they were so loyal. You know, now, I think ownership and where the the – Big wigs of the NBA and owners, team owners and franchises have no mm-hmm. loyalty. But fans, mm-hmm. I think, is where they do have the loyalty to the player. So sure. uh, I, I don't know. I think it's two sides of the fence, but I get it. I, I get I get why a player wouldn't be loyal to a team, but there is always that connection between star player and fan base that I think, you know, the fans will never really, unless you do something crazy or start – underperforming to the maximum. But if you're LeBron James, the fans are never going to turn on you if you're always there, you know? So, true, true. I, I, I think, but I'll add this, you know, you guys are in Boston, and, I, and I'll be as respectful as possible when I say this. Um, LeBron going to Miami was made such a big thing, but in modern day times, in this past decade, Arnett, Allen, and Pierce made the super team possible. That's true. LeBron yeah. remixed we look at it, we're sort of selfish from the Boston perspective. I mean, sure. we, were, we were with Paul Pierce, right? Paul Pierce was our guy. We didn't want him to leave. We mm. said bring talent in. So we look at it from that perspective. Almost but a yeah, decade, yeah. If I mean, if I'm a Minnesota Timberwolves fan and I'm watching these, these teams barely make the playoffs and Kevin Garnett's our only attraction, and then we get nothing for him, <laughs> you get Al Jefferson and Ryan Gomes and a bunch of scrubs in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got some, you got some beef there, but. I got one question for you, Scoops. I, I, What's up? I saw I saw you had an interview with Kemba Walker. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Is this this is his contract year, right? Yes. Okay. How is he looking into uh, this final year of his deal? Because to me, I think he's one of the most intriguing uh, possible uh, big, you know, borderline stars that could be traded at the deadline this year and really help out a contender. So, how is he looking into this season? I mean, when I talked to him, <clears throat> he told me the playoffs was the goal. Uh, there were a lot of just little rumblings about how much he wanted to play for New York and the Knicks, and, and he kind of clarified that. He said, you know, I've only played for one team for seven years, so that's the only team I've ever known. Uh, Kim is from the Bronx. Uh, only He's played in the New York metropolitan area from grade school, high school, you know, even playing in Connecticut, right. on the New York side of Connecticut, not the Massachusetts side of Connecticut. Or I, side, I, I you love know, what you um, <laughs> so, you know, him being in, in, in Charlotte, he's going to play his contract out, but he said, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it as far as what's going on, but let's not act like the Cleveland Cavaliers and the, and the Charlotte Hornets were not discussing some sort of trade at the, during the draft. Um, he's a guy that's intriguing. I just think that he needs some guys around him, and what you're seeing earlier in the, in the season is he's putting up buckets, and one of the things, one of the reasons why he's doing so well is that internally, um, the Charlotte Hornets made a change. 
they hired Jay Hernandez as an assistant coach. And you know, for those who are familiar with Jay Hernandez, Jay Hernandez played at Hofstra University under Jay Wright when Jay Wright was a head coach there, played with Speedy Clacks and some of those guys. And Jay Wright was actually training Kimba when he was going through his uh, draft program. So he's comfortable with Jay. They hired him as an assistant coach. He's been telling me about all the different things that they worked on over the summer, counters, spin moves to the basket, and, and things like, of that sort. But um, he's definitely going into the season motivated, and it's because he's going into, into a situation where there's more pressure around him, and he's around stuff that's familiar. All right, so let me put you on the spot. Total opinion. Not I, I know I know you had a had a conversation with him, but I, I know this isn't facts or anything. Does he get traded before the trade deadline this year? It's possible. I mean, you, you look at the situation. Uh, in the Jimmy Butler situation, for example, if I'm Minnesota, you, you, you want to get something for that player who could potentially leave and they don't just walk. You know, everybody doesn't get lucky like when LeBron went to Miami and that was really a sign and trade for Maui. Um, some people could just leave. You look at Carmelo Anthony in 2011, Denver had to get something for him because the Nets were holding the gun to the Knicks had to do something and the Knicks pretty much traded the whole house. That didn't necessarily work out for them the way that they thought that, that it would. To the case of Kimball Walker, if I'm Charlotte, I want to get something for him, and I don't want him to just walk. That's the biggest piece of the NBA that could decide. Like if he goes to, if he goes to a Western Conference contender, I'm just picturing him in a Spurs uniform for some reason. Like put him on the Spurs next to Demar Derozan in that system. I think then that shakes up everything in the Western Conference. But we'll see. Well, he's definitely waiting to compete. You know what? So wouldn't surprise me. When I look at that Hornets situation and I look at the Portland Trailblazers situation and I look at the Washington Wizards, I'm pulling for all three of their point guards. In a day and age where everybody's pulling for Steph, everybody's pulling for Kyrie, which is a good thing. I, I know Kyrie and have a good relationship with him. It's good to see guys who, who are grinding be in a good situation when they can win. I think for Charlotte, um, one of the things that I talked to Kim about was um, why do you think people aren't uh, paying much attention to the Hornets? He said, because we haven't done anything. You know, you look at the Sixers, you look at the Celtics, they've improved, whether it's through the draft, whether it's through signing, et cetera. He said, so we have something to prove this year that's on our own uh, to prove something. And you, and you look at somebody like Dwight Howard, comparatively, who played for the Hornets last season and is now the member of the Washington uh, Wizards. Uh, he has something to prove as well as John Wall in the NBA's Eastern Conference. John Wall's been balling out of control. And then you look at Damian Lillard, that game last, last week against the Lakers. He came ready to perform. And so you, you look at the status quo of just, you know, the Warriors, uh, whatever team LeBron is playing for, et cetera, kind of give some other some other guys uh, some opportunity to shine because, you know, I, I just think that uh, it's not always fair in the distribution of talent. It's so great, but, you know, you always having the same couple teams. It's good to see somebody else uh, shine for a chance. All right, here's Brandon Scoop B. Robinson of the Scoop B Radio and Basketball Society podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Scoop B. And also he's a writer for basketballsociety.com. That's basketballsociety.com. 